Hi everyone, hi and welcome back to another episode of Battle Rap Resume. This is your host Tom Quee. Thank you so much for listening. If you just want to help support the podcast in any way, it'd be great if you could um, subscribe to us on Twitter. That's at Battle Rap Resume. You can get in contact, email battlerapresume at gmail.com. And some great emails. Uh, always there's some great emails. People getting in contact saying where they're listening from the show. You know, some surprising locations I've had, some great conversations about various eras of battling. Um, people like to talk about the WRCs a lot. And I'm sure we'll talk about the WRCs today, but that always seems to come up. That is a treasured era. Check out the ARC episode with Bagnall that we have today, but obviously we had the ARC episode previous. That was a great episode. Um, we have the blog as well, bellroutresume.wordpress.com, the shop, Redbubble. Uh, please subscribe on the YouTube channel. There's lots of uh, various compilations going on there, various recaps. I'm really enjoying doing the recaps at the moment. I mean, this is kind of in the future now, so maybe these events have already happened, but stuff like Sunburn Free and Born Legacy Free and uh, World Domination 6, you know, I've done, we've been doing a few of those things and um, they've, been a, they've been really interesting. And um, please comment on those please get in touch please please listen to those and um yeah thank you everyone for your support again if you're on itunes as well please subscribe to that so um my guest today as i as i, as I revealed there is is liam bagnall the uh, creative director for don't flop but liam is it, is it fair to say that that title is slightly outdated now like you're so much more than that um i'm not sure if it entirely fits what i am anymore i think like at that point we were I don't know, we're in an era where people chuck around terms like CEO and stuff like that, <laughs> YouTube channels, and it doesn't really define what it is. Uh-huh. But I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's, hard, it's hard to pin down what my title would actually be. I'm kind of the managing director of events. So at an event, I work from like start to finish largely on my own in executing and that event goes successfully and that the fans' experience is the best that it can be. I'm, I'm the director of pay-per-views. I'm the like creative arm of working out like creative documentary projects that we can do or ways that we can advance the company and I'm also like the arm that goes and does stuff like gets us in touch with Channel 4 and makes a series of them or um yeah, so I, I don't know what you would title that, really. No, like, crucial is what you would title that. Like, my God, <laughs> I didn't realise you did so many things. Like, um, Bam, Bamalam, um, you're, you're joining Bagdon, I'm really happy to say. I mean, I realise that you and Don't Flop, you don't work together anymore, but your role, you, you did a lot of stuff as well. I know people are constantly praise you as being an integral cog. Yeah, it's, I think, it, like any sort of, like, um, independent business, yeah, everyone's got to do as much as they can at any possible time to make sure that the unit runs, you know? So um, I think that's why it's so hard to like define what me or Bagnall or anyone within the Don't Flop or who has worked for it or does work for it. Like unless unless you were brought in for maybe just like a graphic-y type role, but even then when you look at what someone like Sam Graphics had to do, he was doing the website and the social media and all of that other stuff as well. So it's really just, you know, you just get stuck in. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the key thing of working in a startup really is that it's not about it's like standing about twiddling your thumbs and working out how we're going to move forward it's about okay we could do this let's do it like a, a great example of what a useful tool Bamalam is or uh, of ways he's gone above and beyond was mm-hmm. I remember for like the fifth birthday when we were like okay it's a bit risky we're going to do a, a birthday event in Leeds how can we ensure that all of our like uh, fans from London can still come and take part and he devised the the buddy system contacted coaches to make sure we could get there worked out times we could get back so there would be yeah like, I did the buddy system and I figured out the coaches mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. I mean that's not something that you'd say is about the rapper's remit or someone that's no. filmer's remit but it's something that, it, you know, but Bam's uh, strengths really land in, like, innovation, and that's something I've seen him take forward into Unilad, and that's one of the things that I love. And that's why I'd always hire him to work with me, and I, I think it's always something, a reason that we'll work together, is because I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe of him creatively uh, about what his output will be, and I'm always excited to see where he will take something. So I think where I'm more... Um, I'm more of a doer and I'll just fucking hammer something out I'll get an idea and I'll just do it Bam's got a different creative brain that will will see things in different angles so I think all the tools of as as a unit especially with Don't Flop and Freddie and Rowan and like Sam Graphics and MA's like capabilities from that era we, we were just you know we were just a creative fucking powerhouse yeah, it was an incredible era, wasn't it, for Don't Flop? That, that kind of time when you're all firing all pistons. Like, a lot of the um, background research for this episode, as I said to you off air, like, I've been looking for a lot of the chronology since your first film battle, uh, which was Most Prob versus Zane Azrai. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get onto that in time to come. But, um, Bamalam, yeah, yeah, joining Unilad, that's, um, that's a nice move from Don't Flop. That's a good move. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like you know, like just to be in a situation like 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 Liam says, all all I can kind of bring to the table is just wild ideas. Yeah, <laughs> so to be in a situation where you can sort of see that go from start to finish, like, and you saw it within Don't Flop a lot of the time as well. But you know, obviously, bigger production unit sort of thing. That's just been uh, like, I think that's. It's just sort of, I don't want to be like, we deserve it, but we do deserve it. It's like the work that we put in and stuff, right? And it's just great to be in a situation where we can take those ideas and execute them to the fullest, like, you know, which is amazing. Like, and I'm thankful for that, man. Yeah, and the sense that both of you, I mean, Bag, uh, Bag obviously you're still very intimately involved with Don't Flop and hopefully will be, you know, forever but I mean Bamalam you've moved on Bagdon you took over from an existing cameraman I mean are you guys okay with potentially seeing a time when Don't Flop has a whole different creative team um, I'm interested in it to a certain extent but I, I mean we're doing stuff like we created training days with yeah. um, instead of having the channel be called Extra the channel is now called Training Days and we basically handed it off to Ryan Morgan uh, Dean Krishna and a couple of people up north to basically run with, you know, like me, me, Rowan, Freddie, and the rest of the team were a bit too long in the tooth now to, to sit through every tryout battle or to be filming battles that, you know, kill our creative buzz. Not because the battles aren't good enough, but when you've gone around the world and you filmed Disaster Cannabis and Hat Stay Head Ice and you, you've captured... Suddenly rapid. York's moral is just like, you know... It, it's just, you know, like, I'd always find the day three of events degrading or annoying, you know. We'd have a great day one and day two and then we'd do something like... Uh, sorry Frankie you know you, you become like heads and shoulders above this but I remember filming Frankie Fraser versus Verity um, outside the footage I don't think saw the light of day no. um, but you got conceited as a judge Charlie Clips is a judge <laughs> as a judge and like I think very choked for like she'd say one bar and have a two minute choke and yeah, then say one bar painful. so I just wanted to get to a stage not that we think that training days is lesser content it, it has its value but we're, we're giving someone a channel that's already got some sort of traction and already has our name behind it to see what they can creatively do with it I don't think there'll ever be a stage where me, Rowan or Freddie per se will be completely irrelevant or replaced um, be, because we are the minds behind it but I do think you'll see how uh, new people will approach it and you know like from a filming perspective cameramen that I've hired you know I, I've, I've trained them up and then I've, I've learned so much of them or they've gone on to you know like for example Charlie Hyams who's one of the most talented cameramen I've ever met in my life right right he started off as a photographer for me asked me if I'd teach him to film and now you know I hired him for Unilad as well just because he's so fucking mm. good at his film work so I, I don't know I don't think there's ever a stage where I feel threatened or uh, worried no. about new minds but it, for me it's always interesting to see how new people come into it and their creative flourish and what they bring to the table yeah it's great to see you have that uh, collaborative energy about you and you just embrace you know kind of um, the other the other people involved and that's really refreshing to see uh, the first thing I want to get onto really is before we get onto any any form of battling like was there any inkling in you when you were young or when you were a teenager to film things was that or was it just kind of living day to day and kind of whatever happens Oh, one billion percent. Mm, mm. Like, fucking, I'm from that jackass era, you know, like right. uh, early two thousands. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I Tony Hawk era, those, right? Like, you know, those classic home movie cameras, you know, like mm -hmm. the little hand cameras that you, you, you grip on your hand and you can carry around. People used to make home movies or holiday movies. Yeah, with yeah, them. yeah, yeah. And me and my friends would make little short films. We'd go around making jackass films. Did you ever do the trolleys in the car park? Yeah, we did the trolleys in the yeah, car park. Yeah, we done that man. as well and filmed it. Oh man, we, we did the best shit for days. <laughs> Sistic involved there, Bam. Was that was that? No, that was that was right. way before. I was like fourteen then. Sistic, yeah. like in primary school. <laughs> oh, Young Sistic, just watching on. <laughs> I remember I tried to do a flip from a tree and I twisted my ankle. Right? Like, <laughs> fucking before real flips, you were doing your pussy tree flips. Man, I was doing tree flips, man. Mm -hmm. And like, um, I remember Jesus. since I was little, man. I was like, I remember I'd say, I'm gonna be an actor. I'm gonna be a kids' TV presenter. I'm, okay. I'm gonna be a film director and. I remember, like, we used to make short films and stuff, and when phone cameras first come out, I always used to make little videos on that, and I always, like, wanted to get into video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I went to university to do film, and it kind of, like, took my whole creative inspiration out of me. 
because like, right. um, it, like I wanted to I, I watched movies like Final Destination about kids with film degrees and they'd work on these big like plain film sets and yeah. they, like great movies and I, I got to university and the only practical project that we actually worked on was a film about uh, depression and suicide uh, yes. it, was, it was kind of crass it wasn't something that I would have chosen to do like I like making stuff for charities about that now like documentary content mm-hmm. but we made like a very you know shitty uh, fucking Eunice Versi shoot a movie about it and I, I, I left the, the degree thinking okay so I don't really want to work the in- industry route because what happens if I you know end up going to BBC as a runner or I go and work as a studio as a runner and I end up working for Jeremy Kyle or I end up working on a Love Island or Big Brother or a show that I just yeah. don't give a fuck about because it doesn't have any of my creative inspiration in it. Like, I, I want to do this shit myself. So I started working in an IT company, working like night shifts and working weekends to try and earn more and more money. Mm-hmm. Couldn't work out a way to get into film. And I'd made a few friends in university. So I went to university with like the guys from People Just Do Nothing. Right. Um, I bumped it like Truth was at my university. And, from the and, 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 and what, what year are you graduating? Sorry, is that like 07, is that? No, I gra- I'm 28. So I graduated in 2009. 2009, I left, right. 2006. So about 2007, I first learned about WRCs and Battle Rap. Oh, I met Because um, my girlfriend at the time went to UEA. I remember meeting Ark and freestyle battling him and meeting, well. What? You freestyle battled Ark? No, no, no. My, my best. Brothers in arms? My, my best mate, like, did, but I'd be in same, similar, like, cipher circles. It's like a picture of me in a cipher with Ark, um, Ur, and stuff like that from about 2008. So you would spit? Sensor is in it, like. Um, did you lay down rhymes? No, I used to be a bit shy about it, to be honest, man. Like, I used to rap a lot. I remember I rapped with, I rapped with, like, I freestyled to, like, scrying outside a foreign beggars, like, gig. And I used to, like, I had a track on uh, an album for Intimate. And, like, um, I was in the car with Shocks the other day showing him my 16-year-old bars, man. Like, they they come out every now and again if we've had the right amount of alcohol. But, um, yeah, I used to rap. No, I always wanted to rap. And you have know? you noticed a kind of, I mean, seeing as you've been in the scene for quite a while then and rapping even yourself outside uh, foreign beggars gigs, have you noticed a decline and incline in quality at a, you know, events you've been at? Are the general more better spitters around, you know, was it better back in the day? Have you seen what do you see? No, I, like back in the day when it was just like freestyle and mm-hmm. stuff, like obviously people can't say as much, you know, like people aren't going to intricately like rhyme uh, Do- Dr. Rob Oppenheimer, the atomic bomb designer, you know, that's not going to come out of a freestyle. But yeah, like, yeah. and if it does, you know, respect that, BA, man. I wouldn't be surprised if. <laughs> nah, true, true. But like, generally, like the the quality that someone can put into something that takes time to write is infinitely going to be better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, I remember like back in the day, like I'd, I'd see someone like Ilmac, Ilmac Bender, and all them that like, used to be my like heroes back in the day. Yeah. I remember seeing like uh, Ilmac versus Disaster, and I, I think he was too ahead of the curve at that point. But I was like mind blown by him he had like I'll have your chicken make me I'll have your chick make some grits maybe chicken and waffles because he used to animate a bitch like Mrs. Krabappel and he had this like internal to external rhyme scheme mm. that just like blew my mind whereas everyone else was just being like yeah, yeah, yeah your mum looks like yeah, Josh yeah. Goodman uh, superimposed on a bag of potatoes um, <laughs> Mike Righteous Mike Assassin Mike, Mike Assassin. Assassin sorry Chat. Mike Righteous that wasn't me Mike uh, wrong Mike yeah it, it's infinitely got better man even if you like look at like a case in point, someone like Soul from the moment he started to where he's at now, how right. he's to condense his style. Like everyone's become more aware of it. I don't know if people coming into it are as good anymore because the problem is nowadays, instead of people like me, bam, like it's, it's rich throwing myself in there when I'm not a battler, but like um, my era of people who are involved in yeah, it, yeah. we grew up listening to Nas, Jay Z, like fucking mm. Big Daddy Kane, fucking all the original like hip hop era. And like we moved into where we're at, the people who come into it now have watched a bunch of battle rappers and are emulating them, and don't necessarily have that same like artistic output in hip hop. And I do think that shows a massive difference in the creativity or originality of people coming in. So like nowadays, when I look for people who come in, I'm looking for rappers. You used yeah. to have more ciphers back in the day as well. Like even yeah. at pop events, there would be people. There would always be people rapping outside and stuff. Mm. And you don't see that no, unless it. And this is the weird thing. Unless it's for the sake of camera. Ain't nobody got yeah. like you know. If it's gonna go somewhere, oh yeah, suddenly someone's got a sixteen. But yeah, yeah. people don't like rapping for the like. You used to just go to. Some, I remember being at the end of the week and rapping with people like Dirty Dyke and shit in a site. Like you just mm-hmm. did it. I didn't even know who it was at the time. Yeah. 
you finish and then someone's like you know you just wrapped in dirty dike and like who the fuck's that like you know like, and then you get down the line and stuff and you look back and you're like yo and I'm sure there's so many ciphers you look back and you're like yeah. that guy's big now or that guy's mm-hmm, done mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. or do it and there's that hunger that isn't there as much so much through new battlers but yeah. I think social media is fucked up. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, you can sort of see anyone do anything now, can't you? It's all replicated. So, well, and, and people just do it like for the gram. People do it for that. <laughs> yeah, people do it for the likes. They feel like if it's not going outside and they're not going to be validated. Then why do it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, yeah, it is a different world. I think like how people write is infinitely better, but at the same time, because everything's become so formulaic, I think to a certain extent, it's lost its surprise factor. Yeah. Because, like, you know, you watch, like, a disaster or someone like that, and you're like, okay, so you know it's going to go da 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 But, like, when you first, like, watched Diz back in the day, like, him versus reverse live and shit like that, mm-hmm. it, it, it was, like, mind-blowing. You, you've mm-hmm. never seen anything like it, because you've just been watching the WRCs and watching, like, this, like, back-and-forth, two-on-two stuff. And then to go to these one-on-one battles where people were, like, dissecting people and suddenly performance became such a bigger thing and like disaster is the ultimate like he's like he's the ultimate yeah, he's example one of the best. Oh, he's like, one of the best man I, I do I think yeah I think he's definitely the most talented battle rapper ever maybe just in terms of pure skill mm. and you passion know. and drive and whatever but, you call it um, imagine like you didn't know about Disney you never existed yep. and no, no one had been that exposed. like he he created people acting in that kind of performance way but yep. if you imagine everyone was like I don't know, like dem- like JCs are conceited where they're quite quiet, and, like demure, but like they're saying really intricate stuff. Mm. And someone like disaster comes along, it's like, oh, oh, oh. it would just blow your mind. Mm. But I feel like people will say he's fallen off or he's not as good anymore because they're so used to the formula. Mm. You know, I've, uh, I think like to a certain extent, people have lost that surprise factor that makes it so like mind blowing. I think Vesaurus is a big victim of that. Like Vesaurus yeah. doesn't really spit whack shit. He's like he doesn't. He's so good at what he does. Yeah, but his like you know his style. Eight years into it or whatever, you you can see people aren't so like they're not like oh wow like do you know what I mean like they really have to listen out for just a very big punch from him. Whereas before you know because you've got so many other people rapping in that yeah. multi style now, it seems old for him, but he's the originator. So yeah. like people should still respect it way more. Like do you know what I mean? But yeah. Like, like, I even remember like back in the day where like you're watching the Ilmac verse and like not only has he got this perfect writing but he's got a rebuttal at the start of the verse the middle of the verse and the end of the verse like he's yeah. skipping in and out of like r- like perfect like what like four out rhymes and going into like little rebuttals that have been triggered in his mind by parts of his writing but then he can still trigger out back to his writing and I- I'd just be sitting around just being like how the fuck does someone do something like that? Mm. But nowadays, like, I, I don't, I don't, I, again, I just think it's lost its surprise factor to a certain extent. Bam, I just want to ask quickly, is there anyone that you remember from, um, you know, when you were first getting into Battle Royale that blew your mind? Maybe not someone now you think is that amazing, but back then, who were your first kind of early inspirations? Yeah, for me, like, you know, like, even, like I'd say Possessed, and what's yeah. this yeah, 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 of course. The structure, the way they rap and everything, especially to see British people doing it. Like, at that yeah, time, yeah. like, that was mind-blowing, you know? And then on the flip side of that coin, Thesaurus and Ilmac, like, perfect. Like, like, do you know what I mean? You know someone that really, like, used to surprise me, though? Lush One, like, was dope when he was back right. like, on the freestyle tip, you know? Like, okay. he fucking... He had some really well constructed stuff in 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 there. And against like, some of the orthodox phrases, he was crazy in the battle. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. So just mainly sort of some of the originators, really, you know. And you, uh, if I'm correct, this divine rights was kind of one of your origins. Uh, you and Cystic. Yeah, yeah, that's going mm-hmm. go way back. We'll talk about that on our show. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. We'll get into that then. Yeah, it's a good teaser. So, um, let's get into the the kind of your, your don't flop your battle rap story. We begin, as I said, with the uh, the Zayn Azrai battle. But is it fair to say that your first kind of main big event that you covered was um, an event from the golden era? I think everyone kind of remembers this. Um, you know, through rose tinted glasses, is a Manchester event with the Luna versus Eddie P and Frisco doubles clash. If you remember. Uh, Seuss, Jefferson, Price, Blizzard, H Bomb, Pamphlet, Sigourney, Fizzle. Like, do, do, do you recall this event fondly? Yeah, um, I wasn't there. You weren't there. I know, I wasn't there. But like, funnily enough, I like back then. Yeah, I was such a big fan mm. that I like. Um, I used to like pay for battles to happen. I used to message. Hey. I used to oh, message. Uh, if you look like for the be established uh, for that battle, I it's it, in that event. If you look at the footage that it comes up. Um, 
what it, it says be established is one of the sponsors that was my company that I started mm, mm. and I used to work as I said back in the day this night shift job it was fucking shit I wasn't doing too much and I used to pay for battles to happen so I paid for I part paid for Nestle versus O'Shea I part paid for 24-7 versus Soul I can't remember what I part paid for on the when, when you say part paid where, what is the money going towards who are you giving the money to I pay for their flights right I put money in for the flights so they come over and battle mm-hmm. um uh, I never knew that word. Ben never knew that. No, that's, 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 <laughs> no. It's like you, you're very, you're our very own Nakaya over here. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I loved it. I remember, like, I watched so many battles, and I felt like I, I owed the scene something. Mm. So that, that, that I know the feeling. Yeah, about actually came after the first start of view events. I started filming mm-hmm, mm-hmm. my first event. It was the exact same first event as Sam Graphics. Uh, we both started working for Don't Flop on the same event. Right, which, which was? was the Times Change Tournament. Right, okay, okay. The first event that I was meant to do was a North versus South weekend in Manchester where O'Shea battled Definition and Seuss battled Blizzard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was meant to be the first event that I did, but unfortunately, because uh, I don't think they had too much cash at the time and I needed hotel covered because travel, hotel, everything else to go and film an event was too much really um, I didn't end up doing that event um, but the first pardon me the first event I ever went to was Blood and, uh, Blood and Water 2 with Nishi versus Jolly J <laughs> um, Kruger versus Verb T yes etc uh, etc et I remember seeing you actually you're quite visible on the front row of a few battles aren't you you were one of them guys <laughs> one of them guys at the front yeah, it was, man. <laughs> Do you remember that guy who, he was like a bold guy and he was always at the front of Luna Battles and he laughed a lot. He was another one of those guys. Not yeah. Matter, Matter, the bald guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There wasn't Matter, but, uh, no, I remember you, uh, Bagnall. You, you look very, you look very young. You look very boy band-esque, if I recall. <laughs> In my pink crooks and castles, uh, yeah. swear, jeez. Oh, yeah, it's one amazing moment, yeah, and the Bagnall won't remember this yet. When no. Bagnall's in, in, in front, yeah, and everyone's being noisy, and Bagnall's being the noisiest guy, yeah, but then Rowan's like, hold it down, and Bagnall starts shushing people, and then starts shouting again, and uh, it's pulled. Look out, I don't remember that. it's in there, it's in one of them Blood in the Water videos, it's amazing. <laughs> respect uh, respect yeah, he hadoukens me as well. What? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, move back, move back, so I am moving back. He's like, Hadouken! <laughs> and then we have a little like weird conversation about how you shouldn't Hadouken people at random. Um, but yeah, that was like, um, yeah, that was the first event I went to. I was going to go to Blood and the Water 1. Yeah. Uh, then for Saurus, who was meant to battle Archaic, Truth, and Respect BA, all on the same event, he didn't get through. Ah. All my friends had bailed out because they weren't really into hip hop, and I was like, oh, I'm just not going to go. So then when it came to Blood and the Water 2, I was just like, fuck it, whatever happens. I'm not trusting my friends who probably aren't going to come to this event. I'm just going to go and I'm going to enjoy myself. Mm. And then after the first event that I went to, it was kind of like a community back in them days. I remember I met like Tiny, uh, who's a dude from Brighton, always used to come down. And I think I bumped into G-Dash. I think I bumped into Bam. They were just like faces that you'd see in every single event. Mm -hmm. And you'd start like talking to people. But I finally like, um, like my first, I I went against Don't Fuck the Battle, but I didn't really have like the confidence in me at that time and I was like you know what like um, I'm not writing as much anymore what I think I can do better is film and Avocados has inspired me so much I kind of want to do that same thing for like England because I didn't feel like what I didn't feel like uh, Don't Flop's footage was necessarily consistent and I felt like I could do a better job so I messaged Rowan on the rap music forums and said ah oh, look like I feel like I can make your battles look better than they do at the moment mm-hmm. just give me a shot and he was like yeah so the first event that I did was the time change tournament with Pedro versus TC yep. um, fucking Mark versus- Soul Rogista oh yeah yeah. No, no, Soul Road no, just happened yeah. in the other side of the time chain, that which was through C versus DPF. Ah, ah. Yeah. Big battle, big battle that one. Yeah, so I didn't film the Lunacy DPF battle because I didn't. I wasn't doing North at that time. When I first started, I was exclusively doing South uh, because Chronicle used to manage people to do the Northern lot. Right. And it became a little way down the line. Actually, when we went to Los Angeles when I basically got hired for King of the Dot to do a uh, Cannabis vs. Disaster, I was in a cab with Rowan, and he was like, oh, you know, this Be Established account that you run, it's so weird that, like, when you're tweeting and stuff, it's at Be Established, it doesn't really feel like it's, like, a personal account. And right, right, right. A lot right. of this stuff that you do with Be Established, 
you know, you, t- you tell me that the guy that you run in the company with doesn't have as much presence anymore. I feel like you could do a lot of those like bars, videos and stuff for us. I did it on the Be Established page on YouTube is one of the like very, very early Tony D uh, bar verses. It has a ridiculous name because I didn't know how to name shit back then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, um, Rome's like, why don't you start doing, bring that concept over Don't Flop and you can start filming bars videos for that. And I was like, yeah, but like, I don't really know what to call myself. I call myself Liam Bagnall. That feels a bit weird. And he was like, um, why do you call yourself Lee Ham Body Bagnall? Because it sounds funny. Mm-hmm. And as a joke, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll be Body Bagnall. Right, right. And I was saved in his bent legs and a couple other people's phones as Lee Ham Body Bagnall. Um, and, and, then, and then the T-shirt was born? And then the Body Bagnall T-shirt <laughs> was born. Yeah. Whereas, Did they sell a lot, by the way, just out of interest? Were they popular? I don't, I don't know, because I didn't actually manage it. Right. Uh, um, Sam Graphics just did it all himself and it was on the DF page I remember Rowan wore it for um, the event with fucking Enigma and DK yeah, yeah. and uh, Tony D versus Adam the Rapper mm-hmm. I don't know I, like, I never thought Pamela Lambert I, Pamela Lambert, I, love <laughs> I remember I made fun of it because I was like why would anyone buy a t-shirt of a cameraman blah 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 but I think they did actually sell some units yeah, I mean, I mean, you definitely, in my eyes, when I was getting into battle rap, you were my first kind of, oh, wow, the cameraman's like this character as well. And, uh, you know, it was good. Like, you know, you pulled it off well. I you clearly are a genuine fan, paying for battles, attending battles. You love this culture. It shows, man. I mean, throughout the kind of cameraman, be it paid or not, have you often been pigeoning yourself that you've been, you know, so close to the heart of this culture? I don't know, man. It's something that, like... It's something that became like clearer further and further down the road, you know. I think like like my my attitude when I first started filming was kind of like um, as long as people aren't saying anything negative about it or uh, cussing off the camera work or the editing, then I'm just doing a good job. Mm-hmm. And I'd turn up at events and I'd always be like in my brain like, oh, you know, all these people are here for the battlers and they're here for like um, the rappers. I'm just a cameraman, so I just used to film stuff go home, I wouldn't try and hang out with people afterwards, I didn't want to seem like a beg, I didn't want to seem like I just wanted attention and stuff like that. So I kept myself to myself a lot at the start, and like I think I didn't realise that I was becoming a character until like I was a character, you know, and I, I didn't realise that, I, I didn't realise that people noticed me. I did, I did like, for, for me I was very like, like humble and demure, like saying I'm humble is not humble. But like uh, uh, back back then, he was very humble back then. I was very humble back then. And you are humble now. Um, <laughs> less so, no. less so. Um, no, I, I am. I, I had, you like, are, man. I find it embarrassing. I, I find how well I've done, or like how people perceive me. Not like people who say negative things about me. People who say good things about me. I find it like embarrassing. I find it like weird to deal with because. I was just I was a cameraman you know I kept behind it it's like as some people have told me I am just a cameraman or I was just a cameraman well, uh, so you're saying people say that to you now to put you down uh, no I'm joking <laughs> uh, it's actually a joke. Well, one person has said that but like it's right, uh, right, right. It's, it's not important That's, that was more of a, a little dig mm-hmm. um but like back then, I, I did just see myself in that way. I saw myself as this guy who turned up. I'd film, get all my shit done, and then like I think um, in the fucking pamphlet versus um, Mark Gris battle or Bowski, Bowski versus pamphlet in Norwich. All right. And there was memes made of me afterwards of like Bobby Bagnall, mm-hmm. and like I didn't realise how badly I reacted to bars and like what stupid faces I pulled oh, <laughs> and then there started being like weird like memes immortalised in Furtz's intro the whole stink face game Liam Bagnall uh, yeah I, I, I didn't like that man like I, I was like every time it Shout was said, I was just like oh fuck the hell man <laughs> But I, I did like the fact that Ian Daniels rhymed with Liam Bagnall perfectly. Mm. I did find those things, like, hilarious at the time. So you recorded Blood in the Water 5? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, you were there Gris, for Mark Gris Blizzard? Yeah, I'm second angle for that. Wow. Uh, who was first angle? So, Critical, who, like, is a very good friend of mine. He's from Sweden, and we've worked together on projects, including a video for Dilated People since then. No way. Uh, me, no. Yeah, so another funny story is me and Critical, um, the two second angles for Disaster versus Cannabis, 
He was the left-hand crossover. I was the right-hand crossover. Avocado was the main angle, and an extra angle was Corey from Grind Time, who did the original Grind Time battles. So this was like everyone coming together for this one event. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like the best just for that fucking video. Yeah, that, that was the whole idea behind it. And then um, for Pat Stay versus Head Ice, that whole uh, world domination, that was me and Critical who filmed the entire thing. Wow. That's so cool. me and Critical actually teamed up a few times uh, Critical then ran the Swedish Battle League and um, he stopped doing that and he just works on like big film stuff now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He, he's, he's brilliant but yeah back then that event Chris versus Blizzard uh, I was second angle yeah and I remember, I remember being so gassed that like my second angle footage made it in a paper or it was on room <laughs> yeah, shoot and I was like yeah oh, so this, this means something and then you get like into it and you've got a billion views online and you realise that it, it didn't really mean anything what? but it was like it was a cool moment at the time it, well, I mean, Kai, it's a cool moment now man it's, it's still a crazy <laughs> moment and like you know I mean you, they often interview musicians and they say like did you know you were writing a classic album at the time and of course they didn't and like did you know that this did it, was there magic in the air when this battle happened because I mean it is a classic no 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 there, there wasn't no. like it was fun it was good. Uh, but, uh, like, but it, it felt good. Bam, you felt something, right? Yeah, I was in the room yeah. and you felt something. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it was also like, yo, this teacher is whooping this kid's ass. <laughs> so I like, I remember like after three months that had 18,000 views or something, mm-hmm. we were then, I, I think, I, I made a Reddit thread. There's a room, numerous people who have said they created a Reddit thread. I created a Reddit thread on this guy being a teacher bullying a student. Yeah. Several people, I think, did a very similar thread. And then I remember being uh, uh, to the test 10, and we're just on uh, stage like, yo, this has just got, it's on 200,000. Yo, it's on 500,000. Yo, yo, what's got, like, everyone was going like crazy. We didn't really understand what's happening because the video just gone fucking mental. But it was all off people purporting it as a teacher bullying a kid and everyone being like, oh my God, I can't believe that teacher took his student to the spot. I can beat him. Oh my God. Uh, When in reality, it is. You know, there's no correlation between them in real life. Uh, Another fun fact about that battle was Blizzard was originally going to dress in a blazer and tie. Ah, Uh, Blizzard was Britney Spears in that video. (laughs) Oh, oh, hit me, baby, one more time. That probably was Blizz, baby. Hit Blizz, baby. That that would have been weird. weird. Hit me, baby, one more time. (laughs) Blizzy Spears. Blizzly, oh man. If we're, start, if we're starting puns, I can go all night. Uh, no, I'm trying to launch a pun game show, actually. Um, oh, so, what? Yeah, yeah, I've got rules set, so I should have you guys on, man, if you like puns. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do it. That'd be good. Wordplay coming 2017. What we do is come up with pun based shit all the time. Are you crazy? So, like, That's all I do. Oh, mate. Okay, so you're going to love this. Right. Bam, and Bam, like Bam came up with an idea for a video. It was a few of his new lab team to come up with it. And Bam's like, okay, so do you know like when your phone goes off in your pocket but hasn't actually gone off? And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like this ghost phone, but really like the phone's trying to kill him. And um, he gets this text one day and the phone's like, I'm going to fucking kill you or something like that. And he goes to show his friend and the phone's dead and his friend's like, but the phone's been dead for hours. <laughs> and then um, what, what would we title it? Mm. Serial killer, fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> Serial killer, that is gold. <laughs> the, basic, the basic sense is, if it is a pun, uh, it's a good idea. <laughs> maybe like yeah. Nokia, I don't know, Nokia, Nokia. Um, maybe. A bit of a reach, maybe. It's a bit of a reach, it's, it's in there. We'll, we'll consider it. Serial killer is literally, it's perfect. At Battle Rap Resume, if you can think of anything good, uh, Battle Rap Resume, <laughs> And um, I mean, Bam, you were there in the in the flood of talent that came through post Mark Mark yeah, Blizzard. Was, yeah, was in there that t- 2012 sort of crop. We and like, lo- you know, as as part of that, in the same way that kind of you know at the start of Band of Brothers, they interview the original Band of Brothers, and you get their expectation. I see in twenty years, I'll interview the original twenty twelve Killer Crop, and it will be <laughs> as emotional and moving. Um, and you know, you'll be interviewed, and, and like, are you a proud member? Yeah, I, I was I was top of the class, you man. You I was nine and zero, oh, bro. Like, I was I was whooping them guys, man. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> uh, Did you beat C? I beat him and I walked him to the park and gave him a push on the swings afterwards. <laughs> Just as a consolation prize. I said, son, you're a man now. 
the thing about it is, like, you can debate whatever, and this is the thing that winds me up. You can say, did I beat him? It doesn't matter. On paper, I beat him. So I'm 9 and 0. So if you want to talk about facts and whatever, yeah, at that time, 2012, and this is 2012, bam, I'm talking right now. I was the fucking man. That's no, why I, I, I was killing shit then. You know what I mean? Like, I was killing yeah. shit. Like, that's the reality. So you did go 9 and 0. Yeah, I'll be your, happy. Your record was out insane. Insane. I'll wreck that all day long, man. It, the, the thing was, like, again, the, what people might not understand now is that one flip that Bam had, it kind of shut down the entire venue and completely changed the mood. That was, like, well, not, what Ark was talking about, how, like, it wasn't necessarily about rounds back then. It was about, like, the haymakers and the heavy hitters. But like, back then, everyone in the room didn't disagree with Bam losing. But it's one of those things that when it goes to video and people have time to analyse it, they'll have a different opinion. But, like, um... What was fun about that 2012 like tryout was that was just after the buzz of like Mark Grist and Blizzard had mm-hmm. really started popping, and at that stage, suddenly we're at Fiddler's Elbow with a tryout card with no names on it, and there's 300 people in attendance. Yeah, it was huge audience. Oh man, and there'd be like fucking the band's tryout got 60, 70 thousand views or something. Mm-hmm. At that time, we're just like, how the fuck are these getting views? Like Enigma, Tongue Twister got 50 thousand. You're just yeah. like, yeah, fuck, like it, it became a fad. It became a fad. It became a thing where, like, um, people wanted to seem like they liked it because they wanted to seem cool, you know? Like, Mm -hmm. there were so many, like, young little hipsters and people who just wanted to be associated with it that suddenly every event, didn't matter who was on it or what was going on. Yeah, people were there. People were there. It was packed. Yeah, yeah. And what did this mean in in tangible terms for the channel? Like, more views is more money is more content? Is that the kind of equation? Um, I think at that time that was like kind of um, I think it was the following year that I gave up my job mm-hmm. um, but that was a time where everything just felt so like sick you know it Through was the like, Test 10 was another massive event then that might be one of the best events of all time giant event like, that was the start of the year that was the start of the year but that event Pedro Zen Pedro Zen um, fucking classic that no one talks about Jack Flash versus Scissors right uh, Calcium Kid versus Eddie P. Oh, that's great. Oh. Kevin Price has some dope rounds against Definition. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Censor O'Shea, yeah. Yeah, that was that. So, was so I was main camp for this event as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so many people there. That, that, how, did you, how do you... I mean, like, it's been commented on a few videos that you make crowds look big. Like, I saw someone comment this on a Boom Bap pre-party festival crowd. I can't remember exactly the battle going down, but you made it look huge, even though apparently there wasn't that many people there. Do you, is that something you have right. more thought for, or...? No, that's bollocks. Right. Um, so back then, I think using the fish I made stuff look a bit different. Yeah. But okay, so say for Bamalan versus Soul, because it was so early on in the day, the tent was fairly empty. But for Archaic versus Villain and for Unanimous versus Zen, that tent was rammed. Uh-huh. We had the most popular tent at that festival, and like it pissed off UK hip hop artists because our tent was the most popping tent most nights. Um, but we don't make crowds look big. Like if we make crowds look big, I'd make the crowds look bigger now. Back then, like every room was completely packed. I think it's how other other channels film them to make them look smaller than they are, more yeah. so than them. Mm-hmm. Because like the thing that we do that like other channels don't do, we recognise it's a live event, so we break the rule of uh, 180 quite a lot. So we can't hide behind the fact that I'm filming forward or I'm filming just at the stage, so it looks like it's packed behind. We're showing the room from all angles, yeah. so we're actually there isn't too much room to make uh, crowds look busy. Um, if the crowd is dead, then you're fucked. You know, if there isn't that many people there, you just got to... I try to make it look a bit darker in the room or I'll control the lighting in certain ways so that people can't see beyond the first three or four rows because there isn't people past that. But stuff like Boom Bap, it was packed. Like, that that was, again, in, like, glory stage. I think that's... Zen versus you, man. Shorty versus Arsenal. Mm. And I don't think I can pick another battle, but those two battles for atmosphere or whatever you want to call it, like... They, they, those are the two battles in my memories that were. Oh wait, when Soul whooped um, Raptor as well. That's the mm-hmm. third one. There you go. But that electricity. You know where you feel. You know when the Rock threw his elbow pad and like into the crowd and it was like electrifying right, as right, a kid right. to watch. It. 
those are three battles that it's like yeah. yo crazy fucking I know, that whole Arsenal DNA event was crazy the first oh, yeah. time crazy crazy I was uh, I was talking to Kraft recently and he's not a big fan of uh, DNA you know he does that R scheme where he puts ARS into everything yeah, uh, yeah. that's pretty hype to me yeah, yeah, it is. Like, like to, be, to be honest, man, like, unless you've seen DNA live, or like, I don't know, I, f- I feel like there's, I'm not having to go at crafty, but I think there's like these, like, lyrical purists or whatever, right, which right, right. saying that is, like, lame to me. But, like, they're just all trying to put, like, people down or try to discredit people, like, eh, there's not clever enough or blah, 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 blah. But the reality thing is, is those same ly- people who are banging on about lyricism, um, can't sell their performance live and would lose yeah. every yeah. single time to a person like DNA because what that guy can do is he'll bully the shit out of you live and even if you can look back at the video and say oh well I want on video because I, I've got lyrical prowess then, well, what's that matter when you're getting bullied live like um, for me like I care about what happens in the room I don't care about the video and being like what I want people what I think is deterrent of people getting better is being able to hide behind stuff like Oh, but everyone said I won it online. But like, if you're not selling your shit live, then you need to work on that because performance is way more like is a very, very important part of battle rap. It's it, you know people need to understand that you can't swing by uh, being silent and being quiet and re- yeah. like so fucking like so like even like Crafty had all these like intricate things. Pedro, Soul's the perfect example. Soul's perfect example of it. But like fucking Crafty had loads of like uh, intelligent stuff for Pedro. Pedro started his round with uh, I get high on Mandy and hug the boss man up in Costco in like in the co-op and he won a flat bar uh-huh. from from the start he won it from like oh, I get high I get high on MDMA and sh- stroke stroke the armchair couch you're the proud owner of a brown sofa he he like he doesn't need to be complex to win you, you can be all this complex but if you can't sell your material and if you're not like able to perform and you're not able to make it like look good for you live at the event if you're looking sheepish while some other guy's rapping then you, you've lost like dna i think he's done too many battles at least he, i think he, he probably did way too many last year but like you can't discredit the man. Like he's, uh, he's number one now, man. He's 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 officially the most viewed battler. He's overtaken Arsenal. How, what do you think of that? Oh, power to him, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> power to him. Like he's gr- he's grinded. People have always made fun of him and said like, oh, how he's got shit material and stuff. The funny thing is, if you hang out with those guys. Like, when they hang out with me, like, yo, body big, you know, I got these fat bars. And, like, they, they, they'll always be laughing at their own material and they'll always take the piss out of it. Because, they, they, like, you know, people who don't know them, like, I'm good friends with DNA, but people who don't know them will think, oh, you know, oh, I bet these guys, are, they're, they're too hood or they're not smart enough because they don't go to a university to understand uh-huh. that they're saying stupid stuff. But if you hang out with these people... They're, way, they're, they're just as smart as all these people who think they're way smarter because yeah. of their fucking education. And they get, like, what, what's stupid about them. So, I, yeah, it really, it really annoys me, to be honest, about, like, battle rappers who try to put down other battle rappers. Like, realistically, is someone like Crafty ever going to be in the running to battle, like, battle DNA, for example? Like, no. Like, probably not. Because it just wouldn't it's make sense. No, no, it's a weird style But then DNA can go and battle anyone, and he can go on any of the bigger stages because every single time he puts on a show and he performs, yep. and that's the, that's the bottom line. To be honest, man, mm-hmm. you know, I think people can discredit someone like DNA and like say, "Ah, oh, like it, it's not complicated putting the letters A R S into something." But fuck me, did he sell it live? <laughs> That's what it is. He sold it. That's what it comes down. To. You Yo, don't even know what he's saying at the end of it, but he just gets you. Oh, crazy! He just right, goes to the crowd, <laughs> like <laughs> right. He so he sells it like live through the years. I met some stars, like yeah. right. He's amazing. Like literally, he's one of the like K Shine. Like, he, he's got better material. Like no offense, to you. his material is like better. But like, if you see him live, like that shouting voice, the projection, it's like fuck me, man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This like performance is all captivating and just gasses you up. You're just like fuck, man. Like, you know, there's so many people who'd never be able to perform on this level. Yeah, so, no, completely, completely, man. And, and uh, like, Soul back in the day, 
he used to be this great writer that didn't have any delivery and performance. And while why Soul is probably one of the best battlers in the world right now, arguably the best at times, is not only has he stopped like having to deliver like heavy hitter over four bars, it's one bar heavy hitter. He, he's like got the Kruger format of banger, 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 banger. But now he fucking delivers it like. You, you're not arguing with it yeah he's rapping like he's taking someone's head off man oh. like, and his performance displays it and like it's just crazy to watch like it's, and you see that's like what he's been going and pretty much as long as Don Flott's been going and he's learned every single battle he's done and every situation he's been in he's understand he never changed what he was writing about or even the stuff he was talking about he just learned how to make people listen yeah mm -hmm. like Man, so I was working on a documentary. No, oh, no, it's a music video for fucking Gary Barlow. And like um, in the video, there's maybe like a bunch of interview sections where we'd free casted and we're talking to different people who'd overcome like great odds and become amazing at what they do. And um, the finished video was bullshit. It was just a performance piece. They thought that the interviews were too serious for Gary. So we didn't put it in there. But one of the interviews that I had was with these two brothers who were boxers and like uh, the younger brother the older brother never went to university and he was jealous of his like he wasn't jealous he was proud of his younger brother because his younger brother had gone the intellectual route and even though he knew that he had to get punched in the face for a living he knew that his brother no matter what would be able to do anything that he wanted but still this kid was like the smartest kid I, like he was younger than me but I learned so much from him because he was like you know I will never be my perfect article. I will never be the finished version of me because the day that I do that is the day that everything starts falling apart. You can never be your perfect version of you. And Soul is exactly that person. Like, Yeah, he's never fully happy with a performance. No. You speak to him after no, no, no. Every no. single time. Like, Man, every decent creative in the world should never be fully happy with what they've done. You know, like there's no video that I haven't looked back on and thought, oh, I could have done this better, I could have done that better, oh, I wish I asked this. There's no like, you should never be entirely happy. And if you are, then you're not going to learn anything moving forward. And that's when you have your next battle and you fuck up and someone kills you. Because at the end of the day, like, you can always get better. And, and so, like, Soul is that guy, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, he's incredible. Uh, shout out Soul. It's the most viewed episode on the channel. We almost double everything else. So it goes to show that people just honestly want to hear from Soul. They know he's the god. You know, they know he's got a serious, serious back catalogue as well. But um, I just want to touch quickly on something the channel started doing around this era, um, just as we lead up into fourth birthday. He started doing quite a lot of extracurricular content, including digs, which I was quite a fan of. You're kind of like, you know, MTV Cribs, don't flop take. Like, you, Do you remember that fondly or...? Yeah, man, that was entirely... That, that was something that I brought to the table. Yeah, yeah, it was great, like, man. Again, like, um, I had a friend who was a graphic designer back in Rochester in Kent, Andrew Jennings, and um, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I just want these... I want the graphics to look quite a lot like the MTV Cribs and it just being yeah. kind of a joke of it. Um, I'm just annoyed that I didn't do, just, like, too many of the series. I only did the two episodes. Um but yeah, I was fond of it. I found it like very funny, like making those kinds of shows, and it was so polarizing doing um, the first episode to moving on to doing like Psychosis Holocaust episode. His house was so interesting. The toy collection. Yeah, yeah. Sure. He's just like he's such an interesting character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I remember like Pedro was like, "Yo, man, like you should come and do a don't flop digs at my house, like." you would literally see cats breeding on the floor, man. And, <laughs> and he was like, oh, like, like me and my mum just get high together and she falls off the couch. And I was like, oh, bro, like, I'd love to film this. We never got around to it. I remember wow. I a list of everyone that I wanted to do a digs with and they had to be entertaining personalities and interesting characters. And I think, I think there was just a point that we just got too busy and we were doing too many drops and too many everything else and like we were doing events every other week that there wasn't really time for that kind of content back then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I might bring Diggs back, you know. Yeah, that, that would be interesting because, um, you know, I had, uh, I don't know if you know Clayton Dam. Who? Uh, he works with Avocado. He's kind of like the main editor on King of the Dot. Oh, no, I don't. Uh, he's a good dude. I had him on the podcast recently. Um, and he was just talking about kind of similar ideas about pushing extracurricular content, wanting to expand kind of the fan base and kind of more entry-level stuff. Like, they have, like, you know, battlers re read mean tweets and stuff like that. And, you know, you guys have an opinion and a few other recurring segments, but nothing too solidified. Like, is that a desire to establish something a bit more like uh, 
I believe we did ballads, read mean tweets first. Yeah, the okay. Com- Uno and um, Luna, remember that shit? Ah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm not discrediting them for doing sure, that sure. same sort of way, but that was content that we did um, first. But like, I, I think me and Avocado are very, very close friends, and I think he'd always said to me that um, he thought that all the extra content that we did was way more like uh, like validating of an actual YouTube channel mm-hmm. so I feel like they've just taken certain things on board and have run with it and are doing amazing content I can't say I've had time to watch it but I think there's a bit like the ideas across like both pla- um, major channels aren't going to be that dissimilar mm-hmm. um, yeah there's only a handful of things you can do yeah, well you yeah. think that's at the box but there's going to be I mean, you, you guys did that Channel 4 collab didn't you do you want to just talk about that that was, that was fucking fantastic uh, they, they were great Thank you. I'm actually meant to be going for a meeting with the, one of the commissioners from Channel 4 this week to mm. maybe see you doing a second series. Mm. But, um, yeah, it's something that me and Loudmouth have been working on for a while. The idea actually came from Bamalam. Right. Like, um, actually, this is a hilarious story. This, like, ties together what we're doing now. <laughs> so I remember, this is actually crazy. Yeah. Like, Bam was more like the ideas guy. I was the guy that would go and make sure that the idea happened or, like, follow through with it. Mm. And, um... Bam had come up with this idea for Battle in Life and Unilad had asked me if there's any ways that we could collab. This was probably three or four years ago. And I'd gone for a meeting with them in Black Butter Records, like uh, Liquid PR's offices. And I got introduced to Sam Bentley and Liam Harrington and we discussed making Battle in Life. And we were like talking about making this content for Unilad, where there'd be battle raps in different situations. Like back then, we were talking about um, like busking battles, and mm-hmm. the guy goes to get on the bus, and they just stopped allowing coins. It was only oyster cards. And Bam said, you know, you'd ask for the to get on. The guy would be like, oh no, not just coins. And then you'd battle them. And originally, we were gonna we were gonna battle random members of the public. It was way more rogue, jack sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Bagnell's childhood returns, man. <laughs> yeah. So like, the ticket attendant prank was originally meant to be that someone comes and puts the ticket on the car. We'd set, put the car in four different places in London. Um, we'd set up GoPros in the car and we'd have hidden cams. And the moment the guy puts the ticket on, Shuffle would come out, Shuffle and Marlow would come out on two on two battle him. Ah. So like back then, kind of like was, a flash mob sort of battle thing. It's kind of cool. Yes, yes. So that was the idea back then, and then like enough of materialized. And a couple of years down the line, I pushed the same idea to Loudmouth because he was like, "Look, I want to make some battle rap for TV." And then we pushed about the life thing, and then that's why we went to make it. And that's why I was like straight away, I was like, "Bam, he has to be in an episode. This is your idea." Mm-hmm. Even though like we've got like. This is this is our thing, you know. This is your idea. This is something that I'm helped like produce in a way. Um, you've got to be in it. And then funnily, it became Joker Star and Tony D in the t- parking thing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It was it was like, yeah, it was interesting to make because we found without crowds and stuff like that, it, it lost a lot of like the life of what a battle is. Yeah. And like it was trying to engineer reactions or use places that would be busy publicly so that people would join in or people would like see it I remember doing the club scene and that was a fucking nightmare because that was a cold night that was a cold night we <laughs> were standing outside in the cold for four hours you know and whereas like Shuffle and Marlo they're fucking they'll put a thousand percent into everything and will be like have no problem doing it anywhere I remember like Big J and Enigma they did struggle uh, more than you'd expect to perform it publicly with people around them. Right. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's a different context, isn't it? I guess, certainly. Oh, definitely. Yeah, 100%. Definitely. I feel like Shuffle and Harry, uh, Harry and Bam found it easy, but at the same time, it was a weird scenario. And there was a moment where Bam asked someone for money for the charity and they gave him a fiver and then went, run, went and run for the bus. And we had to chase the guy down. <laughs> and be like, no, it's not a real charity. It's not a real charity. Oh, no. It's your money back. We can't take your money. It's not a real charity. Yeah. And the funny thing was, like, to get the money from the charity, Bam was like, yeah, so do you want a cat to die? Do you want, like, bombs to go off in Iraq? Do you want to, like, <laughs> so you're saying outrageous stuff. And this guy was like, yeah, here's, here's a fiver, mate. Here's a fiver. Wow. And right, run off. Oh, there's loads of funny outtakes that will never see the light of day for that. But the pride you guys must have felt when he came out, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, Mum, I'm on Channel 4, you know? Like, yeah. it's, <laughs> here's my name. Stop being ashamed of me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I told you this battle rap thing would go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> 
Also, don't forget the Foot Locker thing we done the same same year as well. That was right, right, right. That's out in France and stuff. That was cool. Yeah, mm. and and I just want to touch again um, in terms of the timeline where we are on fourth birthday a lot of guests that I've had on previously regard this as maybe the best DF event I know you were just saying to the test 10 but I mean again this was a, a absolute knockout for Don't Flot wasn't it so many good battles that went so well yeah I mean this event was one that so to the test 10 just became like the barometer of mm. what was a good event you know we would we'd always bring up to the test 10 was like oh was that better than to the test 10 like mm. was that JC Chiller yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. So I mean it was like fourth be the fourth birth fourth, 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 fourth weekend is another one that was added to the barometer because well, that was one of the first times we had like Sway, Rizzle, yeah. Gets. And like, we had like the balcony area for the select like there was that it was just yeah. everything just seemed like a movie in that event. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, it was cinematic, wasn't it? It always looked yeah. good regardless of what battle. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Like draw twists and turns in the storyline and like, you know, Jefferson Price and that. Holy shit. Like, you know, and then like just like bullet like, choking, man. I mean, we'll get onto it when we do your episode. Yeah. But that was heartbreaking. <laughs> All every part of that. I think the only thing that didn't work in that entire event was the random two on two with uh, where Double O ended up playing the role of God on stage. Oh, my, oh of Mickey was there. Yeah, Uno, <laughs> right. Yeah, that that was the only that literally. Other than that, it was all perfect. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Def- Grist wasn't that good. No, it was, it was, it was a bit of a slow. Um, Gr- Grist was yeah. just on fumes. Yeah. Chris tried to make that too complicated. Yeah. Like, uh, basically, he had a whole... Um, I mean, something that uh, Chris will talk about, but he's very interested on this, like, weird poetic cult in France. And um, it's mental, right? They do stuff like... Um, they'll they'll stop themselves from being able to use certain words or certain letters or, or vowels or... Like, they, they have really weird, like, constructs of making people be more creative in poetry but it's basically impossible for anyone to get into it so this battle was actually a calling card that he wanted to do yeah. to make them <laughs> notice because he wanted to be the first British person that was accepted into this French like poetry cult it's like now you and, see me that's oh, amazing mate, mate, it's crazy so like in that battle he, he tries not to use the letter R I in any ver- uh, verse so like he has he put loads of crazy like um, restrictions on himself mm-hmm. but he had one flip oh no there's only five letter I's that he used in one round and in other rounds he tried like blocking other different literary techniques yeah. just to try and get their attention but then he realised he had a flip and it had definition in it so he ended up <laughs> using two more eyes. but like um, also the, he uses um, the, like I forgot what he told me it's something like it, it spells out a word the whole thing he has several parts that if you put it together spells out a word like he went in, incredibly like deep on it but at the end of the verse when people have heard it and he said oh I've only said I five times people are going to be like oh fucking hell mate is he trying to join the British intelligence in a world war <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean like it's... it feels it feels like something out like the Kingsman like yeah, like but... Grist is trying to be recruited to like the Royals pun service <laughs> <laughs> mate it's so deep it's so yeah. deep. It, it was like oh, Grist is so intelligent I mean me and him are making a show together for uh, mm. uh, Red Bull now um, but that's going to be a huge step forward in like where we've ever taken stuff before yeah yeah that's going to be really exciting and um, it's interesting how these things work as well isn't it you were saying that it's very fortuitous that uh, Blizzard and Grist took off and then you have the 2012 killer crop yourself BAM included uh, points if you can tell me the video uploaded after Shotty Arsenal what was the next upload oh it was someone's tryout someone who is majorly big now it's either, uh, hang on after Shotty Arsenal, I'm thinking about who's left from 20. 20- are, you, are you listening at home? Uh, well, uh, I'll give you the answer now. It was uh, it was Marlow versus Josh Fox. Yeah, I knew that. I <laughs> knew that. Yeah. yeah. How 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 far out is the upload schedule for you guys? Do you get your batch of battles after say a fourth birthday and think right, this one comes out in four weekends, this one comes out next weekend? Like- no, we, we did that on purpose. We did like to certain for battles like we would look at the upload schedule and like if you were there in the room for fucking Marlow versus Josh Fox, we were blown away, right. absolutely blown That's away. Awesome. Like uh, Bam wasn't there, but like fuck me, like when he did his third round. We like turn around. I remember, we were like teasing and shuffle at the time. So yeah, your mate's better than you. But like, how genius the concept was 
of like talking about how amazing like how amazing Peterborough was and no one had done something like that mm-hmm. no one had even like tried to take the sort of creative angle <laughs> oh, there's, there's Gris doing his spelling shit and looking a fool but, but <laughs> I mean he, he was trying stuff that was too creative right 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 <laughs> Hopefully the French picked up on. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the just the worst time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But Marlow blew us away. I remember, like, I remember seeing Marlow battle and just being like, "This kid's the truth. This kid is insane." I was like, "It's different level." That was the Roan versus Blizzard event, which is funny enough the first event I ever filmed on Five uh, D Mark III. Mm-hmm. Before that, I was using the Seven D. And what, and what uh, does that mean for someone who, like myself, who doesn't really know cameras? It's moving from a little boy camera to a big boy camera. Ah. <laughs> it means yeah, that he ain't got to press stop recording in the breaks in, mm. in rounds where it's because before I remember you'd see Black and we'd have to hit the stop and start again because they only had a 12 minute limit on the cameras mm, wow. that he was using at that time. And battles went on for a while. So <laughs> it's an art form in just getting that right. You know? Yeah, man, the 7D. It has a 12 minute recording limit. I remember filming Mark Gris versus like Worthless and um, we got to I was like before the battle I was like yo like how how long are the rounds because um, like, I've got to stop and start and they're like oh two minutes two minutes and the round started to be like four to six minutes and like it got halfway through I think maybe Mark's round I had to stop start I tried to do it on a point and I thought there was going to be a break or like a uh, uh, like a pause reaction mm-hmm. and I missed one second of the battle and that was one of the first battles that I ever edited myself and uploaded on the channel and everyone was like oh they cut a choke out they cut it out <laughs> back in those days I was the only angle mm. I was the only angle so if there was ever a mistake I couldn't cover it up you know I can use five or six cameras now but like back then if there was a fuck up it was fucked <laughs> and um, so moving from the 7D to the 5D completely changed what I was doing because suddenly instead of having a 12 minute limit you had a 30 minute limit the 1080 that you recorded in was like um, full frame the battles just looked fucking clean as fuck because it was a BBC standard camera at the time and just yeah the footage improved dramatically yeah it, that, that era that sort of fourth birthday the fifth birthday era especially seems like don't flop you know you really got your gears going you knew what you were doing visually um, right. bat- the battles look fantastic like some of these events uh, are absolutely terrific you know the two on two tournament um, was it Distinction for example yeah mm-hmm. that was great I shot out on the 5D mm. and what was cool about that for me was um, looking back at to the test 10 which I shot on a 7D on a fisheye lens and then distinction what I loved about it was that I'd see the quality had gone to 5D and like the lighting looked completely different and the feel of it was completely different because mm-hmm. the camera was just way more advanced so actually I remember at the time I, I remember that being quite a hallmark moment for me, actually, of being like, oh, fuck, it's so cool that, like, to have stepped up. And there were so many good battles on that event as well. Distinction was joke. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Hilarious. Youth that, Oracle Matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Youth Oracle Matter, which was absolutely brilliant. That felt yeah. special at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Pedro Carlos, R.I.P. Yeah, Carl. yeah, yeah. No, Pedro oh, came with me. Man, shit about Carlos and that. I knew Carlos was going to lose that battle. <laughs> yeah. I knew he was going to lose that battle because he was in my hotel room because he didn't have a place to stay and he was like doing all of his bars in an Asian accent high on MDMA at four in the morning and I, I just knew that it wasn't going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> and how was this, Bam? I mean, after fourth birthday, before fifth, fifth birthday, this kind of year, was this like, you know, the biggest success you experienced? It must have been great to be in Don't Flop at this time. Uh, yeah, I, do you know what? It was amazing. And at the same time, like now, like, I'm like, I'm glad that I enjoyed it and whatever, but it's like, you know what, where it becomes cringe, yeah, is when I see like new battlers sort of being like, this is the golden era, and it's sort of just like, it's really not, it's really, no, it's really not. not. Like, you don't know, and I'm sure that, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you guys know. Yeah, like, yeah, man. like you know, like so. I, I, I sometimes look back and go, God, I hope I wasn't acting like Danny Jax is online, you know. Right. <laughs> right, right. Sort of, um, it it was great, but there's one sort of thing just in general, like your ego at that moment when you do 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 a trial and you get sixty thousand views on it, like mm-hmm. when the three previously tried to hit in ten and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. 
it really does something to your ego, you know, <laughs> like yeah, uncontrollably. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, then you get into 2013 and everything was like running like a perfectly like smooth machine. It was stressful though. Yeah, it was super stressful, but it was like... 2012 was the most like fun. Yeah, that was the dream era. Like everything was fun, man. Right. Like 2012, like everything was so fun. 2013, we were killing it. But like the, the stress started hitting because like I, I gave up my job. Yeah. So this is when I gave up my job. I went to live in London with Bam. I'd gone from earning like 40, 50 grand a year uh, secure money to earning maybe a hundred pound a month for like a uh, hundred pound every two weeks or like 300 pound every two weeks. And I'd be walking like 12 miles a day, six miles to and six miles back from the YouTube studios yeah. that we were using at the time. I wasn't eating. I was just like um, doing everything I could to try and get money up and fucking do whatever and do loads of extra music videos so I made all the Dots and Philly music videos and I made loads of um, like I did Michael Parkinson video with Bam and I remember we got paid um, a bag of weed between us for that video um, <laughs> fucking like oh, I, I was, did videos for Skymish and stuff like that I did a lot of videos for free to try and get uh, approved formula videos that I could then charge other people for I was doing like weddings photography loads of extra shit just to try and get cash up. Um, so it became, it became more stressful at the time. Yeah, because yeah. that was the time where you went from sort of like, you know, we had the boom, yeah? You know, the Mark Risk boom, yeah, what yeah. you would call it. And then it's like, right, well, we need to suddenly become, like, you go from being Del Boy Trotter to like fucking Wolf of Wall Street or whatever, you've got to, be, you've got to become about your game. And that 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 is 2013. That was everyone trying to convert it into a real business, you know? And that in itself, when, when you're a bunch of people that, are coming from your own sort of freelancing backgrounds and whatever and never run a business in that sense that's where a huge amount of stress was coming into it oh, you yeah. know like just dealing with all of that and then obviously you get the other side of the boom is like I'm saying you get all of these battlers that suddenly got an ego yeah. like <laughs> so you've got an external sort of stress coming from within the camps as well you know what I mean yeah, yeah. so 2013 was that real sort of like buckle down and get things like legit sort of area and it was like you know a lot of shit going down the 2v2 tournament checkpoint verdict summer standard like you know fifth birthday itself it's mad your, your yeah. workload wow yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. it's the best we got into YouTube studios at that time as well man, oh, what, man. Does that, what does that mean sorry because I don't really appreciate how did you get into YouTube studios and what does it give you oh man so it changed the game so I remember at that time I got a message from Cobra 90 saying like um is there any way that you can hook me up with the contact for Blizzard and Shotty because I want to make this video which was the Manchester City versus Manchester United video they made uh, in return I'll give you a contact at YouTube Studios and you can go and use YouTube Studios which has their own edit suite film suite and everything else so we went from I was working on a fucking shitty old Mac at that time that was really slow right. we went right. suddenly to being able to use top arranged Macs at the YouTube studios and be able to use film sets and to be able to use proper lighting and borrow cameras and borrow lenses to really like how efficient we were just completely changed the game. I remember it used to take me like 16 hours to 20 hours to export a battle and then we went to YouTube studios where it'd take 20 to 30 minutes to export a battle. Yeah. You know, the, the implications of that on efficiency are ridiculous. You know, so like me and Bam were working from YouTube Studios, Freddie was working from there, and I think from us going from working in all of our separate bedrooms around the country to them working with each other all in a contained room, it, 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 it like enhanced our like personal relationships with each other, but just our workload was just smashing out, and we were able to do loads of extra content and make loads of extra stuff because it was just readily available to us. Yeah, and um, what is the life cycle of footage? So let's say you shoot a battle of verdict. Let's say you shoot 100 bullets for Saurus. I mean, after that's done, do you sit down and say, okay, Bagnall, you're editing this one, or, I mean, what's the kind of workload, you know, assignment? So, like, Bam started editing battles a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Freddie, like, did more trailer stuff and he'd want to take certain big battles and I generally did like all battles and there was a stage where Bam started doing like smaller battles and then like we all started just sharing load because like originally yeah I was doing like drops and stuff like that. yeah Bam was doing like a lot of the drops and bringing forward different like content for extra and um does Ur um, edit anything cool? No, 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 no. But he will, like, direct and edit from time to time. Like, um, some of the more documentary-style content, like, me and him will sit down on, or sure, sure. Freddie and him will sit down on. But Bam at that time 
was slowly getting into the editing style of stuff, but really was like the, the second event coordinator. So Bam was doing all the set of standards and Bam was doing um, a lot of events himself. So at that point, his focus wasn't majorly editing. And I think that's when I, I you know, I, th I think I became like head of media in a way to a certain um, extent where Freddie would just handle stuff and I would manage it and then um, hand off workloads. But we would discuss beforehand who would do what battles. Like even now, me and Freddie will sit down with each other and uh, we've got a document where we'll colour code who's doing what battles and yeah. uh, which ones we can't be asked to do, but one of those will take the bullet on or whatever. <laughs> what, what's been one of those recently? <laughs> Let me tell you this. Uh, <laughs> when I started editing battles, yeah? Yeah. Every bad battle, basically any battle with bleaking or something, oh yeah, that's a bam edit. Any warm up fucking <laughs> hell, whatever, yeah, bam's on that one, don't worry. Yeah, like, do you know what I mean? I came up on the, on the trash. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's a big one you've done, bam? What's one you're proud of, edit wise? Whew. I've done millions of battles, I can't right, right. think. I can't think. Right, I'm sure there must be some. Do you do unanimous villain, or is that me? I don't know. See, I don't know. Yeah, it will say it on the on the thing. I have to go back. And right. back on, Joe, what, what are your proudest moments, just in terms of battles you've edited? Um, you know what? One that turned people's heads was Tony D. Chris Lee's. Right. Mm, that looked beautiful. Mm. Yeah, like I think that was one that I put a lot of love into, and people yeah. were like, "Oh shit!" Uh, C Major versus Soul. Uh, wow. We went crazy for an edit. Um, like. Uh, I'm trying to think, man. I've, I've pretty much done all of them, you know. Yeah, like, you're editing every day. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I get less time editing now, but I've done pretty much all of them, you know. Fifth birthday, just quickly. Was that just trying to like bottle magic? I mean, it was a good event. I was there. I remember some of, the, some of the battles came off good, but I mean, it's not remembered quite as fondly as some of the other birthdays, fair to say. Um, I like that event. That was Tony D. Chris Lee. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a big event, yeah. Shuffle T and Marlow versus amazing Dyer. total match. Yeah, um, yeah, I thought that was a good event. Right, right, right. Um, I told Ben that he was racist for no reason whatsoever. Oh, Lots of stuff about man. Ed Ice's cock. <laughs> Is that right as well? Bamalam snakes <laughs> me in that battle. I don't. So. But why are you going to say that? Oh, that's that's what we need to know. That. Don't worry about <laughs> But Bam snakes me, bro. That's when I learned, you know what? Bam's a snake. And then you guys seem to have a slight, like a blitzkrieg strategy at times where you do two big events back to back, straight into Set the Standard 10, which was another ridiculous card. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, I feel like we was pushing the boat out then. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, I think I think that, that event could have been held for a later point in time or yeah. whatever. Like, you know, because even though the card was solid, it was just... It's just this thing. If you do too much big events, one, like, people can't afford that sort of thing all the time, you know? So crowds are going to affect that to some level and stuff. And two, it's just like, when you've kind of given, like, you know, what I think the thing with the fifth birthday is it just wasn't the fourth birthday and it was too close to the fourth birthday for anyone to think otherwise. Like, do you know what I mean? And it's yeah, the same yeah. thing, putting, you know, set the standard 10 straight on after the fifth birthday. Mm -hmm. You just got this sort of, like, people are still, some people still haven't seen those battles because they haven't come out online yet when their next big event's coming on and stuff. So it becomes, you sort of split their focus and, mm. you know, you've got was to it, pay. Was it a Leeds London thing? Was, you know. It might have been, uh, yeah, it might have been in, in, you know, but it might have also just been loads of people spent money on the fifth birthday, like getting there from other places like yeah. London. And yeah. when it came to a big event in London, maybe a month after, like, they're like, I can't, I can't do another one of these, you know? Yeah. It's Christmas soon. It was like December. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think realistically, we were, you know, we'd, we'd clusterfucked ourselves and there was, there was too many battles. But, uh, like, there was two, two big events back to back. Yeah, two big, two days. Um, where really, yeah. I, I think sometimes we get a bit too ahead of ourselves and do that. I think like, um, yeah, yeah. I just think yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. there's situations where um, we'll put two events on too close to each other. I think last year we did it with Atlanta and the seventh birthday, um, where one event ends up suffering to a certain extent because you've got one. Or even like Sunburn suffered this year a bit because World Domination's on the same weekend. Um, so if you know, like Quill, who would have 100% been on the card, unfortunately couldn't be. And uh, a couple other names, unfortunately, couldn't have been on the card. But it's just. Um, 
it's just timing of events sometimes. But I think uh, we, we'll do a thing where we'll have a year of just smashing huge international events and in the following year have a quieter kind of build up new talent year where we'll largely focus on UK versus UK um, but because we'll have set too high a mark of ourselves the year before it will feel like it's it's too small that year um, so it's finding a balance to a certain extent but I do think set the standard 10 came way too close to uh, a fifth birthday although it did have a lot of great battles on it as well yeah it did it was a fantastic event um, had some really yeah, really good stuff good series seriously good stuff uh, yeah great end of the series you say great atmosphere love the design as well of the flyer the kind of desolate landscape I, and shit. On, um, yeah man yeah, yeah. We, we went for sort of like Lion King um, elephant Lion. yard sort of yeah do you know what I mean? <laughs> Loved it, man. And, and, and like, you know, you say you go from these big events to the kind of more uh, battling in, you know, domestically. So the Raise the Bar Tour then, what sort of decision was this? Was this difficult? Because it seems like you went to a lot of dis- destinations all over the map. It's a strange story about it, but I don't, like, yeah, I don't, don't know if I can get into it, to be honest. Right, right, right. Uh, the Raise the Bar Tour, again, I think, like, the idea of touring and doing events around the place was a great idea uh-huh. but um, I think at that time we had too much on our plate and it wasn't planned out properly and stuff like um, Frequent Fort versus Toucan likely were things that should never have happened uh, <laughs> like, no, not even as an insult no, just no, like no, no. I think like what our original plan with that tour was for it to be this insane tour I think we played with ideas like touring one battle which ironically they did with Danny Jack Wilsey yeah yeah but more along the lines of touring something like Marlow Shuffle versus Big J and Lefty and touring sure, sure. around the country and doing stuff like that was the idea. And I feel like the round the, uh, the I forgot what the name is, round the what tour? Um, it was the, the Race of Bar. Uh, yeah, and I just feel like the battles weren't at the level that they should have been from what we were attempting. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But like, I, th- I think like that was one of the things that we got lessons on uh, moving forward but just really I think at that time without a, a, enough business savvy and stuff like that I think we just like oh, you know it can be pulled off quite quickly when in reality that's something that I put months and months and months of planning into now to ensure that it could be executed to like an impressive level not just executed mm. yeah the battles never I mean there were some good battles on there but they always felt a bit scrappy compared to some of your other output that year yeah, and I think with that, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, the idea in that tour is like, we're finally bringing Don't Flop to your hometown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I to see with that is like, with your familiar faces, Tony D, like, do you know what I mean? Right, it was right. like, with your local rappers, guy from Wales, like, do you know what I mean? So it was like... Um, but I'm doing the tour on one was hilarious, though. That was meant to be a three on one, and one of them pulled out. <laughs> who who were the two that were facing you? Uh, Temu Jin and 4BZ Forbes Forbes he's, he's doing alright nowadays okay. <laughs> I'm, not yeah. aware, I'm not aware of him but um, so we, we, we push on to another big event you had that year which is a great event as we, as we move forward um, the Manchester London event that was great oh yeah it was excellent mm-hmm. Tony D shotty everything you kind of wanted to be really went well <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, that, that that was a great event. It felt mad being there. Oh. It was um, it was quite a stressful one to put on, but yeah, that's great. Man. At the Love Ritz. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was great. I like those big events. Stress me out on a different level, but it's it's only out of the places I just care so much about it. Um, all going to plan, but like when it's like big and there's a lot more people there, it, it creates more stress. But like, it's an excellent event to run. Uh, it's an excellent event to be at and to film, but I generally don't have any sort of fun at any of those big events. And, those and, big events are stressful as shit. Yeah, I, I imagine, man. I mean, it just uh, is it just the sense of like you know making sure you don't miss anything or what? what where is the stress emanating from? Everywhere you've got people asking you this, you've got to worry about is, yeah, is yeah. so. so yeah. Do, do you know what I mean like everything just comes into play? Oh, we asked the sound guy to put the right lightings on it, like and this yeah. with the mic, and he hasn't done it yet, or do like do you know what I mean or like oh wow, like <laughs> are, are we like ready to go on the next battle and the next five battlers only one battler from each battle is here, like oh fuck, oh well, like the whole crowd of people that are here going to suffer about it. And the people who are battling not going to give a fuck about it. Oh, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, 
do I need to mic people up? Do I need to light people? Do I need to record an interview in a break? Oh, someone wants to do a drops in the break now, do they? Oh, someone wants to interview me in the break. I've got to refix the lighting. I've got to refix yeah. the sound. I've got to fix the graphics. In between battles, I've got to go and do the pay-per-view. I've got to dump all the footage from six different cards and it takes 10 minutes per card. I need to have a cigarette because <laughs> I'm so stressed. Um, I need to call about 10 different people to find out where they are. I need to go and manage someone who's upset about something. Um, I need to go and check with the stewards to see if they're okay. Oh man, like the, the responsibilities that I do at an event, uh, it's, it's so much more than filming or directing. It is yeah, fucking yeah. stress, man. So there's big, big events that amplified. If I'm rocking up to a show in Manchester that's like a sound control and it's small, them stresses aren't really there because um, it's much easier to like handle. And generally, it'll just be with an all UK card of people that were guaranteed be there. Um, the bigger events. Uh, quite a lot of different story yeah and uh, 6.5 birthday as we move forward I just want to say that I love the um, footage quality on this one uh, especially the pit battles uh, the lighting's excellent the vibe is terrific old school don't flop mm-hmm. yeah that Pedro Shane man right yeah, yeah. looks so good oh, it does wow. doesn't it it looks so good that, that event was dead though man right there might have been 20 people in the crowd yeah it did seem a little bit flat yeah. I love the filming of it. I love doing that. But um, we were back at the wardrobe, which is where Two the First Stone was done. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It felt weird being there because, like, um, was that you versus Dino? Was that Natural? Yeah, that was there. No, oh, yeah, no, you're, both of them happened in that venue. 6.5 is what we're talking about now, and that was me, Dino. That's you versus Dino. Okay, yeah. Oh, man. So, like, all the battles that were there banged. But it was, it was a little bit of a strange vibe because we were used to a big, big crowd at that event. But again, where I think that uh, event was too close to another one, um, there wasn't a big enough crowd. Um, but the footage online, because there wasn't too big a crowd and there wasn't people like trying to get attention by ad-libbing and being like, oh, look at me! Right, right, right. It actually ended up with very good footage. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a highlight of an event. That was good. And then the expansion, which I think every DF fan w- watched upon and just thought, wow, this is so fucking cool. When you guys went over to the US and, and started killing it on those events as well, like, Math Off a Chiller, that is an incredibly good battle, I must say, yeah. from many DF USA battles that are good. Like, uh, was that something that you've been thinking about since you joined, or was that kind of a newer idea? Oh, we'd always wanted to move out to America. We were, like, apprehensive about grind-timing ourselves. Right, right. And trying to expand too much and it fucking up the company. But, like, in reality, uh, it was a move that we were always going to have to make. Um, and when we went out there the first time, I loved the fact that there was at least three British on battles on the card. So, it, like, what was important to me, what I said to the team when they were we were conceiving the idea was we have to have people from the UK over there so it's branded as us versus Americans or DF yeah, yeah, yeah. in some way, um, which hasn't always been the case. But I feel like we've built up um, enough DF names out there by people that we've brought back I mean Carter Deems wasn't really getting taken any notice of until we had him versus Isaac yep. and the Battle Pops and um, I think like the positives that I think we've created in the scene from doing the DF USA stuff is now a lot of lesser known names are getting put on in different leagues and a lot of other people are trying to find talent which I think for the scene in general is a very good thing mm-hmm. um, but like a funny story is um, Math Hoffer versus Chilla Jones was originally meant to be Math Hoffer versus T Top. T Top, yeah. And it was blocked um, by someone, let's just say. Norbs. I mean, yeah. But like, um, so that battle didn't happen there and then just happened on a different channel. There's a funny few situations where people have done stuff like that, though. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, DNA and K Shine and Averb and Hitman were try were they try a certain people try and pay them triple to back out of the battle ah. um, and then do it on their platform. Right. Not that I can name any names. Wow. Also, um, DNA and Shine had gone to try and do the doubles uh, idea to a different platform, and they were like, "No, it's gay." Uh, they did it with us. And obviously, it just blew up. Mm, mm. Just um, yeah, it's funny how things work, eh? Yeah, DNA uh, DF wasn't not going to be receptive to two v twos. We always love them, haven't we? I mean, kind of like DNA and Keishon are kind of seen as a renaissance, and I guess in a way they are. But no, two v twos is part of. I mean, bam, no, you've been I, part I think of that, I think like 
Shuffle and Marlowe were the Renaissance. Yeah, oh my God, wow. Shuffle and Marlowe were the Renaissance of two-on-twos. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I feel like DNA and K-Shine uh, packaged Shuffle and Marlowe style for uh, a, more sh- a more road audience. Right, right. And in reality, what they're doing could be very closely... Um, like that whole idea of teamwork and chemistry can be closely related back to Shuffle and Marlowe. So I think they created a boom to a wider audience, but literally every motherfucker in battle rap was watching Shuffle and Marlowe like these guys are the best. Yeah. So it wasn't the fact, it was the fact that people have watched Shuffle and Marlowe and emulated them that had changed the game. It wasn't the fact that DNA and K-Shine did it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, I think yeah. And we need might... them to battle. Um, yeah. Um, it was meant to happen wasn't it so. yeah I mean it's just the issue of hopefully Keishan getting his passport sorted so you know we try to get the passport sorted for six months uh, he said you know like to get the, the passport I have to have a train a plane ticket booked and we're like you know what I'm pretty sure this isn't the situation right. we don't want to let the fans down booked it passport didn't come blah blah blah, blah. Yeah. so at the point that Keishan has a passport that's something that can be discussed until then it's not something that will happen, but I can promise you that there is a two-on-two title match at the eighth birthday. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think who that could be against. Yeah, who's even left? <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt P. Soldier? I don't know. It's been that. Uh, yeah, 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 no. Um, interesting, interesting. Yeah, because it's got to be some sort of, like, they deserve it to some point. Like, you know, the contenders or whatever. Yeah, it can't just be, like, you know, yeah, I don't mystery know. and deep throat oh, yeah. fug. I mean, I, I know the potential list for ABW, mm-hmm. but I'm just going to eat these crisps and drink this Desperado. No, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's really interesting. And I just want to... Um, you know, conclude before we get onto the questions at the end, like something like, you know, a seventh birthday, uh, a sunburn, any of these kind of mega cards, like what, where does it start? You know, do you guys just meet up and just throw around ideas? Do you do it online or what? Mix of both. Mm-hmm. Mix of both. I mean, like, I think it always starts in the chat. Yeah. Starts in the group chat on Facebook. When we see each other, we'll do, it's got, um, it's got harder for me to be involved in, every meetup and stuff like that. A, because I'm a little bit run down from working all the time and be like, I, I try to fit in a bit of like personal, I'm, more, I'm trying to, like one thing with Battle Rap was that uh, it took over my life to such an extent that I didn't really see any one of my friends who were outside of my Battle Rap circle right, for years. Yeah. So, like, I wouldn't see my family as much, I wouldn't see people as much. And then like, I found it, because I bow up such a weird world and a lot of people outside of that world didn't really get it, I found that weird hanging out with people outside of it. Mm-hmm. So like, I pretty much exclusively just hung out with people like that. And really, after certain events that have happened in my life, I said to myself after I traveled around Mexico last year that I, I want to make time for a lot more people and spend a lot more time having fun and doing stuff outside of battle rap and outside of the bubble of body bagnall and sure. <laughs> everything else that came with it and just completely reality and check myself to just like enjoy life again and not be like sucked up into this YouTube world. So really like <clears throat> when I'm not working at Uland and I'm not meeting up to do shoots and stuff like that, a lot of the time now I like to go and see for, uh, people that don't want anything from me. Um, who just want me for me in a way who are just like friends and uh, people that uh, just want to have a laugh and stuff it's not like morbid or weird it's just if you spend too long in that battle rap bubble or only hang around with people who want something from you or um, want to like idolise you in a certain sort of way it changes you as a human being and it's not a positive thing that I need 24-7 so I do try to meet up and I do try to do stuff but it's harder to, to get as much time as I used to have for it. And I think that's something that like um, battlers don't see, they won't ever get, like no one will ever really understand that unless you've been in the position that we have doing this because it's like, it becomes your 24 seven force. Like, you know, and that's like any, like any startup. If you're in that, yeah, that is your bread and butter. That is what you, you're thinking, how do we make this a million dollar project? How do we do, like not dollars, whatever. You know what I mean though? Yeah. Sort of thing. And it just consumes you on a different sort of level. So it is really good. Like battlers have the beauty of they can go back to their day job or whatever and be regular government name and not think about it for X amount of hours or whatever. But you wake up, you've got to think of all these battlers have messaged me with their personal problems. 
these cards are still got to get sorted. We've got to get this. Like, do you know what I mean? It's just constant yeah. battle rap, battle rap, mm. battle rap. And it can be unhealthy if you don't find, the, like Liam's saying, those parts of yourself again. Because, you you know, you are essentially the brand. You are Don't Flop when you're in that position, you know? Yeah, you and got, and, and that, that, has left, that has led to you leaving Don't Flop then for um, how, how long since you left? I left... It was probably March, I'd say. Right, right. I, left. I didn't say anything online or da 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 da. Um, and then I had my little like rant recently, which I think sort of put it into people's heads that I was actually I'm not a part of it at all, you know. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, but we can talk about that stuff or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we'll get into that. But I just wanted to uh, touch on that quickly. So, um, back now, we'll just wrap up with a few quick fire questions, if that's okay. The, uh, the the first one being, and this is going to be so difficult for you to answer. So um, let's just go with one you really like. Uh, don't flop battle your favorite if you have one but one you really enjoy oh um oh it's got to be a O'Shea Calcium Kid wow recent yeah yeah okay okay Jack Flash scissors <laughs> is that funny man yeah yeah uh King of the Dot um Pat Stay Hollahan mm. mm classic classic uh URL <laughs> Big T Hollow the Dog. Mm. Oh, Soul Card Soul Card Fox. That's hilarious. <laughs> God, yeah, that, that is that is hilarious, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, final two questions. Then the first one being your uh, your favorite musical artist or band that is in no way hip hop related. That's a sick question. That's a sick question. Um, oh, who do I draw for? So I can't really go R and B or anything like that. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, someone, uh, someone said grime recently, but I was like, that's still kind of. Uh, yeah, that's still. Boring. And that's not a musicianal band. That's a. No, no, no. That's a genre. Yes, uh, it's uh, nuts. Oh, come on! I think it's quite <laughs> difficult. Um, I know, like Tom Petty or Nirvana or. Right, like, right, right, right. Nice. Um. That Tom Petty and Nirvana, interesting. And finally, Bagnall, uh, your favourite film? Oh, he's going to be here all day. <laughs> Changed every time, but right, I'll, right, just, right. I'll stick to a standard response of Fight Club. Uh-huh. I'll stick with God. Oh, <laughs> oh, mate. Memento. Oh, all of the ones tatted on his arm. All the ones on my arm, yeah. <laughs> City of God, Memento, Fight Club. What, what, so, what ta- so, do you have the tattoos of the films or? No, I've got very subtle references to them. Right, what are the how, what are the what are the sort of iconography? Um, for the Goonies, I've got the matchstick. Mm-hmm. For um, Good Will Hunting, I've got the words I could always just play. Right. For City of God, I've got Rocket with a camera. For nice. Akira, I've got the blue and red pill, but it's disguised as a flash on the camera for the City of God guy. Uh-huh. I've got um, an octopus tentacle for Old Boy. I've got the final scene of Fight Club where they're both holding hands watching the cities blow up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got Butters in the tap dance suit wearing, uh, holding the balloons from Up because right. uh, um, it reminds me of my best friend. And I've got just a couple, uh, I've got the penguin from Fight Club and I've got a few other just little bits. Oh, nice, nice, man. Well, uh, uh, finally, I guess, um, how do people get at you? Uh, at Body Bag Noise, uh, social media? Yeah, content? at Body Bag Noise on everything. Man. At body, Instagram. Or um, they, can ser- they can search for mine and Bam's podcast. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad Company. You can search for me uh, on Bad Bars mm-hmm. if you want to see someone present and work. And if you want to see any documentary I've made, they're either on Unilad or a whole host of other uh, platforms. No, and, and Bam as well. I mean, like I say, we will do our episode in the future, so look yeah, out for that. But. Uh, all of my online stuff should be at Joel Watts online currently. Right. So it's nice and simple. At Joel Watts. And um, yeah, everyone check out Don't Flop, of course. I mean, uh, you know what it is. You've watched all these videos, but check out maybe some of the ones we mentioned that you haven't seen. Um, Unilad as well. You guys obviously work on that. So um, check out the website, like them on Facebook. But um, thank you again. Thank you, Bagdall. Thank you, Bam. Really appreciate it, guys. Oh, awesome. no worries, man. I hope yeah. I hope we've been some sort of help. You have, you have, and I'm sure people are going to really look forward uh, to uh, be looking forward to hearing this episode. So, um, cheers again, guys, and uh, yeah, again, subscribe on YouTube, please. Like the video, comment uh, at battle at resume, battle resume gmail.com. Thank you so much again for listening, everyone. This has been uh, another great episode, and uh, yeah, thank you. Bye.